Okay, we are live. Great. Thank you. Good evening, Red Team Village. Uh, my name is Adam Pennington, and tonight I'm going to be talking about emulating an adversary with imperfect intelligence. So before I get into content, I wanted to start off with a little bit about who am I? Uh, so I'm the lead of a project called MITRE ATTACK. I'm guessing some of you are probably familiar with it. Several of the other talks in the Red Team Village have been leveraging it. I've been with MITRE for about 12 years now. Uh, if you're not familiar with MITRE, we're a not-for-profit who primarily runs federally funded research and development centers for the federal government and does work in the public interest in things similar to ATTACK that we're, we're putting out there for people to use. My principal focuses are on threat intelligence and deception, but I've been working with adversary emulation teams for years on looking at what sorts of intelligence they're pulling together and how well the profiles they're building up look like real adversaries. Most of my time today is spent on MITRE ATT&CK, but I've been an operational defender as well as a cyber threat intelligence analyst. I've spent time in multiple security operations centers. I've been a part of ATT&CK for quite a while, so I've been around since there was a spreadsheet with no ampersand. Uh, ATT&CK originally was an Excel spreadsheet and uh, helped gather a lot of the intelligence that we use to create ATT&CK in the first place. Before I was at MITRE, I was at Carnegie Mellon for 11 years trying to collect all of the degrees. I'm also a scuba diver. I'm certified for technical diving, so decompression rebreather diving. And I've spent time as a professional uh, live sound engineer, which might explain some of my taste in home audio equipment. I've been around DEF CON for quite a while, obviously. First one from home, like all of the rest of you. Some of the key points I wanted to get to today. So I'm going to be looking at a very uh, intelligence-focused approach to adversary emulation. I want to start off by setting the stage on adversary emulation, getting into the definition I'm using. Now, I'm not expecting that, that people here haven't heard of adversary emulation. I really just want to make sure that we're on the same page using the same definition because adversary emulation is something that I've seen mean different things to different people. I'm going to talk about gathering and extracting the intelligence necessary to do adversary emulation. Where do we find it? How do we pull it together? And then I'm going to talk about some of the flaws in that intel. So what's, what's wrong with it? How do we recognize some of those imperfections? And then how do we deal with it? How do we find the gaps in our intel, fill them in, and leverage those to create a complete plan that we can use to actually emulate an adversary. So I said we, I was going to start with the definition. This is the definition of adversary emulation that I'm using for the rest of this talk. Adversary emulation is a type of red team engagement that mimics a known threat to an organization by leveraging threat intelligence to influence what actions and behaviors the red team does. Pretty straightforward leveraging threat intel, trying to use that to influence what we're going to do. So what's different? You know, the, the big one is that it's driven by threat intelligence. So it's driven by how the adversary actually looks. There's a good chance we're going to use that threat intelligence to scope things more than we might in a normal engagement. So we want things to look like an actual threat. And so there are things we might not do and, and take out of our playbooks in order to stick to that. There's a good chance it follows a constructed scenario. In order to stick to what a real adversary looks like, we might ahead of time create the set of activities, the set of behaviors that we plan to do so that we can keep to that. And the hope with all of this is that we're getting some idea of how our defenses might fare against a given adversary. It's still not the real threat. It's still not going to be the same but we're hoping to get close enough to start to get some ideas. So there's a bunch of new challenges that emulation brings in around intelligence. And I'm going to be covering several of these in my talk tonight. The first, the most basic one, the need for intelligence in the first place. So needing to know what an adversary looks like. We might not have enough intelligence out there on an adversary that's in a form we can use. It might not describe the sorts of activities that we need as an adversary emulation team to go out and look like the adversary. 
the adversary we want to emulate, there may just not be enough intel on. We may not know about them. And so we might need to fill in the picture a little bit more to be able to really emulate them. And finally, you know, we're pulling all this intel. We need to be able to turn it into a workable scenario. So my team has an adversary emulation process that we've used in several other places and presentations, uh, as well as documents. Uh, but it originally comes from a presentation a few years ago by then attack team members Katie Nichols and Cody Thomas. And the process we work from is to first gather threat intelligence. So figure out who your adversaries are and start to pull in all the information you can find on the, the adversary you pick to emulate. Extract techniques from that intelligence. So start to look at what the behaviors are in that intelligence so that we can pull them together into a plan to be able to look like those behaviors. Analyze and organize that intelligence. So taking those behaviors, looking at what's what's there, what isn't there, filling in any gaps, and then pulling that in together into a plan we can actually use. Develop tools. So we need not malware utilities and other things to, to be able to operate with. And then finally, do the emulation. So I'm a threat intel guy. I'm going to cover the uh, most threat intel focused uh, pieces of this process. And so what I'm going to focus on today is the first three steps in this process. So start with the first step, gather threat intelligence. So we're going to need to choose an adversary and then pull in information that we can find about them. So before we can start gathering data, we need to identify the adversary. I've covered two ways to do this and looking at gaps that we're hoping to assess in our environment and considering who is, is targeting us in the first place. I'll then go through a couple processes for gathering data on that adversary. So pulling in information on things that they do after they break into environments, that's likely to be most of the space of our engagement. And beyond behaviors, there are some things to think about uh, beyond just what techniques they do. So what tools are adversaries using? What other groups are associated with them? So what other th names might we have that are describing some of the act same activity? As well as an adversary's campaigns. So a series of intrusions that are happening in a, a time period that are attributed to the same actor. And on top of all of this, we probably want to think about the time frame. Some of the actors we might want to emulate might have been in this business a very long time. Uh, so I'll, I'll be using an actor later who is um, thought to have been around since at least 2004. What they looked like in 2004 is probably a little bit different than what they look like today. So there are a lot of ways that you can find uh, lists of adversaries, you know, information on starting points for who it is you want to emulate. I've got my biases. I'm going to leverage attack, but you don't have to. Um, but a decent number of, of red teams we have seen using it for adversary emulation. So some other options uh, instead of attack. If you have a internal threat intelligence team, that is tracking on groups that are, you know, hitting your own organization. That might be your best source of threat intelligence. So they know about the threats that, that matter most to your organization. You know, they um, may have the best picture of the techniques that are really relevant to you. So that could be a really good place to start. There are people that um, might be uh, able to sell this information to you. So there are commercial threat intelligence providers where, you know, for a fee, you can get information on different adversaries you might be interested in. Or you can go to the same well that we do. So everything that we're pulling into attack is coming from open source threat intelligence reporting. Uh, and so you can go out and look at some of the same sorts of reports we do ourselves. Because I'm going to be using attack for the rest of this talk, I'm just going to quickly get into a few of the specific aspects of it that I'm going to be leveraging here. So I'm not going to get into, you know, all the defensive use cases, things like that, just sort of the basics of the framework structure and then the group's information that we're going to be pulling from it. 
So I think probably a lot of you have already heard of attack, but at its core, attack is a knowledge base of adversary behaviors. It's like an encyclopedia of things that real actors have been seen to do in the wild. So not just uh, things a red team has done, not just theoretical, but it's, it's actual adversary behaviors. It's freely available. Everything I'm going to be talking about today, every resource I'm using is, is out there for free. And if it's code is open source. So let's talk about structural here. This is the view most people use of, of attack. It's what we call the matrix. It's, it's a layout of different activities that adversaries do. The way it's organized is across the top here, we have what we call tactics. These are the adversary's broad technical goals. So it's something like initial access. The adversary is trying to get into my network. Or exfiltration, the adversary is sending stuff that they've stolen out of my environment. Or something a little different like impact, where an adversary is trying to cause destruction or disruption to systems or my environment. Under each of these tactics, we have what we call techniques. And those are how the technical goals are achieved. Uh, and these are sort of the basic unit of attack. Uh, I've, I've seen a bunch of techniques. Uh, Sacherio was just using several technique IDs in her talk. And so these are getting down to more uh, specific ways. So instead of initial access, we now have something like phishing. The adversary is sending a malicious email. That's kind of an exciting talk for me because this is the first time I've given a talk in years that I've been able to fit the matrix on a single slide. So we, we recently did a fairly big refactoring of attack and going from just tactics and techniques to tactics, techniques, and sub-techniques. So there's now another layer of abstraction under a lot of the techniques. Te Sub-techniques are just more specific techniques. So instead of phishing, we have something like spear phishing attachment or spear phishing link. So it's, again, getting more specific. These techniques have all, these sub techniques have all the same properties behind them as techniques. They have all the same mitigations, detections, everything else. Uh, it's just a deeper level of specificity and they have a parent technique. Finally, getting all the way down to detail, we've got procedures. These are specific adversary implementations of techniques and sub techniques. So instead of spear phishing attachment, we might have that APT12 has sent emails with malicious office documents and PDFs attached. Okay, our goal was to find out stuff about groups. Something else that attack has is profiles on a number of different threat actors, over a hundred of them. And so this is what a group page looks like. We've got a brief text description of, of the group itself, some metadata associated with it, we have what we call associated group descriptions. Different companies, different threat intelligence providers use different names to describe the same or closely related groups. And this is natural. These organizations have their own definitions of these groups. They may not be quite the same. That's one of the reasons we call it associated groups instead of what we used to call it, which is aliases. We keep track of what techniques are used. So we've taken open source threat intelligence reporting, gone through, and figured out what those reports say that the adversary has been doing. <coughs> Similar to our groups pages, we also have software pages. Uh, those keep track of different pieces of software that an adversary is using, everything from utilities to things that they've custom written as well as all of the techniques that that particular piece of software is able to do. And finally, there's references for all of it. You can go back, you can check our work, you can see the original references, and make sure that you believe what we say about it. People use attack for a lot of different things. I'm only touching on an adversary emulation tonight. It's kind of a good use case for attack, though. So it turns out that adversary emulation is what attack was created for in the first place. The, the reason we originally created attack was that we had a red team who wanted to look like some specific actors, wanted to create playbooks, create plans, uh, operate 
and then wanted to be able to compare notes with the blue team and see if they saw the same things that the adversary had done. Okay, so if I want to actually start to pick out an actor from all this set, you've know, got 100 actors, so we can start by looking at how um, specific actors align with some of the gaps that we think we might have in our defenses. So this is coming from APT28. Everything in blue here is techniques that uh, we've identified from multiple open source threat intelligence reports. It's not using any commercial or government reporting. It's just things that you also have access to. I'm going to be showing a bunch of diagrams that look like this. This is basically the same matrix layout I showed in the introduction a second ago. I do have a number of the sub-techniques expanded out to show a bit more of the detail. Um, but you're probably not going to be able to read the labels, at least over on, on Twitch or YouTube. But all these uh, diagrams I'm creating are using the Tech Navigator, which is an open source tool we provided. That's a URL to actually work with it yourself. And I'll release the slides for this uh, right after the talk and work on getting the Navigator layers out I'm using. So for looking at the techniques that APT28 has used, we can then compare that with the our own defenses. So if we take the same uh, Tech Navigator, we lay out where we think that our defenses can catch or not catch an adversary. So what's in red here is notional gaps in the defenses for an organization. So what I think that I can't detect today, okay? So if I take that, that adversary, I add the gaps to it, I can then create something that looks like this. So I now have the APT28 in blue, our gaps in red, and the green here is you know, where we think we might not might have gaps. So again, without the slides, probably not going to be able to see which individual techniques are highlighted, but we can see, you know, maybe APG28 isn't the best match for us. You know, they've only got maybe uh, 10 techniques that, that overlap with things that we think are gaps. So, okay, what else can we look for? We can also look at adversaries who are targeting us, so especially if we've got our own internal uh, threat intelligence team to help us. They may be able to help us prioritize here because uh, hopefully they know who it is who's been coming after us. And again, there's a couple different ways that we can prioritize based on this. So we can start with an adversary who targets us regularly. Now, maybe we've got some actor who the first Monday of every month, like clockwork, sends us a spearfish. You know, maybe, maybe they're not the best. We don't, you know, maybe they, we think that our defenses are pretty good about them, but they may be of a lot of interest to us just because um, they're trying so regularly. They're, they're definitely a persistent threat. We can look at adversaries who have targeted others like us. So if we've got some actor who's tried to break into every other peer in our industry uh, and you know, has succeeded in places, well, we're probably somewhere on their priority list. You know, we're, we're in their priority intelligence requirements for who they should be breaking into. So you might want to understand how it is that we might face against them. Uh, finally, you might want to pick an adversary who doesn't target us very much or you know, we've never actually seen, but they might but has a high skill level. You know, the, the actor who keeps us up at night because you know, we, th we think that if they came after us, they'd probably succeed. You know, they're, they've got the high skill set. So the adversary I'm, I'm leveraging today for a lot of organizations probably more fits into this last group, uh, the, the keep you up at night adversary. So the adversary I'm, I'm going to leverage for the rest of this talk is Turla. Uh, Turla is been, has been attributed to Russian state activity. Uh, they've been around for quite a while. They've been seen since at least 2004. I, I kind of like this group in that they're cross-platform, so they don't just stick to Windows systems, but they've been known to, to go after Mac OS and Linux. And they, they use some interesting techniques that we, we don't see a lot of actors use. And so everything in attack has been seen somewhere by some actor, but there are techniques that there are really only, you know, a certain number of high-end adversaries that are getting into them. 
So we've picked our actor. It's time to start gathering data on them. So if I'm not using attack as my data source, I'm going to want to probably go out there and start gathering intel. Uh, and so, you know, I can start looking through open source, publicly available threat intelligence reports. There are quite a lot of them out there these days. Uh, there, there really weren't that many when attack started, but we, we do have quite a wealth out there of, of reporting now. You know, or I can leverage the, the version of, of a lot of these techniques that's in attack. So we're going through some of these exact same reports, trying to find what behaviors and techniques are in there. And then we're, we're putting out that same information in attack. So it's information you already have access to just in a digested form. So we've got this intel. If we're going from our own sources, if we're bringing in open source threat intelligence reporting ourselves, we're going to need to go through a process of extracting techniques. Uh, and in, internally, we, we tend to call this mapping. So the, the quick process that you're going to go through in these reports is something along the lines of first finding the behaviors in the report. So figuring out what is it that you know, our activities that the adversary did, you know, the things that we're going to want to later uh, be doing ourselves. Figure out the tactics. So it takes a little bit of experience in understanding what you're reading with adversary behavior, but what is the adversary's goal for each of those behaviors? Move down to more specifics. Move down those columns of attack. So go from the tactic to a technique, or even better, all the way down into a sub-technique. And we recommend doing this as a team. You know, everyone has their own biases and preconceptions and how they read Intel, something I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. But comparing notes can be super effective for uh, canceling out different issues you might have. So I'm only going to be briefly talking about how to do this, but my friend and former attack teammate, Katie Nichols, and I released training earlier this year on how to do this mapping in much more detail. Uh, the URL for it's uh, available in the slides. Again, I'll release the slides later, uh, and it's completely free. The videos for it are up on YouTube. So this process of mapping attack techniques, you know, this little snippet of reporting has quite a few of them in it in the way that we would interpret a open source threat intelligence report. So first we're going through, we're identifying each of the behaviors. So this is the highlighted in yellow bits where they're either describing something an adversary did or you know, they're using a tool where it's relatively clear what the behavior is that they're, they're using it for. We're going through, we're get, getting down into tactics and then getting down into techniques. So instead of create batch scripts, we're interpreting that into attack for Windows Command Shell, T1059003. Instead of Windows Run Key, we now have Registry Run Keys startup folder, so T1574001. And we're just going through the entire document, repeating this process over and over again and pulling out the full set of techniques that we're able to find. So once you've pulled out all those techniques, you need to structure your intel. Uh, and so I'm, you know, again, using the attack navigator. Uh, this is the full set of, of Turla techniques that I've extracted from attack, pulled out of uh, their page that's in there. Again, everything that's here is only based on open source threat intelligence reporting. So it has the limitations of that. Uh, and so that's, this is the sum total of all of those threat intelligence reports we mapped with Turla. Okay, uh, so we've got a pile of intel. Uh, what do we what do we actually do with it? You know, is is this any good? Do we have a picture of the adversary yet? And so we're going to need to go through some more work to uh, figure out what we've got. You know, what the adversary is trying to do. And do we even have enough of a picture to be able to make a plan here? So the first two steps I'm going to work through are establishing the adversary's goal. So what is it that they're trying to do? Understand their modus operandi a little bit better in terms of what we're later going to want to uh, operate like. And an important point to remember is that this goal is probably not technical. 
the adversary is probably not focused on getting domain administrator or stealing a particular password. They're probably interested in fulfilling a um, intelligence requirement. You know, they, they have some piece of information that they want to steal from your environment. So the goal is likely to be something more like data theft or to stop you from operating than, you know, hack the Gibson or, you know, brick a particular computer. After you've determined what that goal is, you need to look at what the gaps are between an adversary getting in and reaching that goal. So what is it I don't know about the middle that would let me uh, look like that adversary? So to go through those first two steps a bit, uh, so establishing an adversary goal, um, you could take a look at which tactics the adversary is using. So we can see that, that Turla has some stuff in collection and exfiltration that have got nothing in impact. But instead, I'm going to go back to the original reporting. So this is a Kaspersky report on Turla. Uh, and so they talk about how Turla went through. They're searching for emails. They were specifically looking for emails related to NATO, energy dialogue. Uh, and then shortly afterwards, the report talks about them exfilling the information. So, okay, they're stealing information around particular topics. Uh, similarly, an ESET report, they're going through, they're getting into the victim's uh, Microsoft SQL database, pulling documents out of it, and again, exfilling, and taking specific information. So we've, we've got a relatively clear picture, and we can look at other reports and see the same thing, where over and over and over again, Turla is, is stealing information. So it looks like they're focused on uh, theft of information and, and exfiltration. So I uh, said that we need to then um, examine gaps between access and goal. I'm going to cover for a few minutes first, why are there gaps? So, you know, we've, we've got this intel, it's an attack, it's all out there. You know, why isn't that enough for us to, to be able to work with? Open source intelligence likely doesn't paint a complete picture of an adversary. Uh, frankly, commercial and closed intelligence probably doesn't either. So there are biases in the information in how it's gathered and what information is gathered, as well as nobody has perfect visibility. It's very rare that you have intelligence that tells you everything an adversary does from the point when a victim clicks to the point when they actually are stealing information. And by putting it into attack, we add our own problems. So group intelligence in attack is subject to our own biases. Some of them are very similar. Um, and, you know, we're adding on to the biases that are coming from this open source intelligence. So and some of that is from how we map from these intelligence reports and what it is we actually choose to come in. Now, bias is usually a negative word in the English language. It sounds bad, you know, sounds like, um, you know, we, we may not like certain intelligence, but in threat intelligence, we accept that all sources and intelligence have biases and limitations. And so we work to understand those and what they are so that we can account for them. So some of why we have uh, these biases in our reporting. Any reporting source is going to have a visibility bias. There are only certain types of information that a given uh, source is going to have. You know, they might only have certain types of sensors. An incident response firm may only come in and have access to forensics and whatever sensors were in the environment at the time. You know, whereas things that can only be uh, seen in real time, so maybe decoded command and control traffic or registry monitoring, other things that don't really leave much of a forensic trace might not be in their visibility. So there's novelty bias. So I'm, I'm kind of a beer snob. You know, in, in normal pre-COVID times, I walk into a good beer bar. I look at the taps that are there. And I see a bunch of stuff I've had before. It's been on my untapped list for, you know, years now. And I, I see the one tap that was the thing I've wanted to try for a while. Uh, re reporting can be a lot like that. So, you know, I've got my reports. 
I've got my, uh, you know, APT 1338 report where I've got a new actor. We've never seen him before. They're doing something new. And I've got my APT late report. I'm, I'm going to put out the one that's, that's brand new, you know, is more likely to make a headline. Uh, and so our, our intel is biased by this, where some reports are more likely to come out than others. As people are creating the intelligence in the first place, they have availability bias. Availability bias is a classic cognitive bias. I have some things that I am more familiar with, that I'm, I'm more used to seeing, that I'm more likely to recognize. So somebody who's done a ton of incident response, they've seen you know PowerShell over and over again, they might be more likely to notice the PowerShell activity and not notice that, you know, say the adversary got into the BIOS over here or something super novel. Victim bias. So there are some victims where there is more likely for reporting to come out than others. Uh, so there are only certain firms that can afford some of the companies that are putting out a lot of this threat intelligence reporting. Uh, some victims are also in industries where they're a lot more likely to allow reports to come out. Now, there, there may be issues with regulators if there's any information about them having been hacked. And so who the victim is is going to matter a lot for if we ever hear about it. And finally, in terms of open source biases, we have production bias. So some sources write more reports than others. Uh, if, you know, one company is writing, you know, dozens and dozens of reports that all have actor behaviors in them and another company is just putting out a couple, uh, then, you know, we're, we're going to have more information to work with from another. And so I said we compound it. Uh, and so we, we add our own biases to these and the types of sources we select. Uh, and so a lot of the stuff I've been talking about is in terms of information from security vendors and um, threat intelligence firms. So 92% of the reports that we have an attack, uh, as a point when I made this slide, are coming from security vendors. 3% are coming from government reports. So these are things like uh, public indictments and other public available government reports. And a few are coming from press reports. You know, some, sometimes there's a article in Wired or the Register that describes you know, really good, unique adversary activity. We have our own availability bias. So, you know, that mapping process of going through reports, uh, we've reduced the number of, of techniques in attack a little bit recently, but there's still over 160 of them. Uh, and so there's, uh, it's hard for us to keep a working set of, of all of those techniques. And so we've got the techniques that we remember in there and are at the tip of our tongue. And then we have the uh, techniques in attack, like um, hidden file system that we almost never see in reporting. We have our own novelty bias. So we've, we've got, you know, dozens and dozens of reports on fuzzy deck using PowerShell, but we've got this one brand new report on APT Elite using transmitted data manipulation, a fairly new technique. Yeah, uh, we're, we're probably going to go for the shiny new report. And so if you're using Intel from attack, there's a couple other caveats to, to realize. So our reporting that we've got in there on a given group page is from all different time periods combined. And there's some reasons why we do this. Reporting frequently doesn't say when the activity happened. So a report, we, we might have a date on the report itself. Not always, and uh, a pox on people that put out threat intelligence reports with updates. But we don't even know uh, necessarily when the intrusion happened. And I've seen reporting where I know the intrusion that they were talking about was four or five years old, where it sounded like they were talking about something recent. Some of the reports might only talk about a small range of activity. So some why we end up adding the stuff together is so that we can talk enough about a single actor to paint a picture. So if I only have one report with, you know, 10 techniques in it, it's probably not telling me the range of activity that an actor can do. Our group pages only include behaviors that are directly tied to actor activity. So our standards for what we're adding into those pages is that the reporting says that the actor did it. 
And so that doesn't include behaviors of software that adversaries use. So if there is a uh, malware analysis report out there that we're putting in attack, that's going on those software pages, and we're not including that into the activity of the given adversary. And finally, the reporting we're using doesn't always agree on attribution. Uh, and so we're, we're sometimes left trying to figure out what the heck group we should be even putting this into. And, and hopefully, in most cases, it's accurate. So that sounds awful. You know, so what, what do we, what do we do about it? Yeah, I've talked about this as our source of intel, and now I've talked about all these problems with it. Um, so the important part is to understand that there are these types of limitations and biases in the intel that we're using to do this emulation. Once we know that there are these limitations and gaps are there, or we can start to determine where the gaps are in our specific intelligence. And so we, we don't just throw up our hands and say, well, I don't know anything. You know, I'm just going back to uh, normal red teaming. We need to account for these gaps and uh, fill them in as we build our adversary emulation plan. So that was a long aside away from Turla. But let's start to look at how we might spot gaps in our specific adversary picture. So taking Turla as, as our example, how might we see some evidence that our information on Turla isn't perfect? Well, I can first look for missing dependencies. So um, my colleague Andy Applebaum wrote a blog post a couple of years back on, on trying to find related attack techniques. So both uh, dependencies where in order to do one technique, you might need this other technique first, or techniques that are very often seen together. And so that could be a useful source for, for doing this. But I'm going to zoom in on a couple places in our profile of Terla. So let's look at initial access. So we've got some you know, pretty simple techniques here. We've got drive-by compromise. We have phishing, spear phishing attachment, phishing, spear phishing link. Okay, relatively germane. But if they're doing each of these things, and these all do come from successful intrusions, there are actions that need to follow that for the, int the intrusion to have been successful as it was. So I now I take a look at our execution for Turla, and I look at, you know, I've got user execution malicious link, so they sent a malicious spear phishing link, we clicked on it, okay? They sent us a spear phishing attachment. Oh, I don't actually have an execution technique for that. So there's, there's clearly a gap here. Uh, it's something we probably need to fix, but it um, there's I would expect there to be here either user execution malicious file or you know potentially if they're being really ninja exploitation for client execution. So you know maybe they're uh, maybe it's a user clicking on the attachment or maybe they're popping the Outlook. Um, but you know something is missing here. Uh, we can also look for hints of dependencies, you know, and so we're, we're trying to create something in the style of an adversary, not necessarily exactly what they did. But so I can look at something like lateral movement. So, okay, we see them doing lateral to trans tool transfer and Samba Windows admin shares. Windows admin shares, if, if they're doing this technique, it's usually something where they're being driven by operating system credentials to get around the network. So, okay, there's something that should be in here as uh, credential access so that they've got the creds to do that. Well, what I've got here is is brute force, which they, they could be using to do OS credentials. Uh, credentials from password stores is usually uh, other types of credentials rather than operating system. And so I'd really expect there to be something more like OS credential dumping or um, you know something with Kerberos tickets. So you know domain authentication here. So it's a sign that I might have another gap that I, I need to deal with. Uh, less you know less dependable, but you know, another way that we might be able to see signs of this is looking for things like unusually sparse tactics. So in the case of Turla. You know, we've got an adversary who's been around since at least 2004, as I said in the beginning of this. Um, most adversaries over time are definitely developing multiple techniques to do a given tactic that's, that's important to them. 
And in the case of Turla, all we've got here for exfiltration is exfiltration of cloud storage. And another reason why that's a little bit suspicious for Turla is that Turla is older than cloud storage, uh, at least in the sense that we would generally mean by it. Uh, and so there's there's some signs that you know there might be another gap here in our picture of Turla. Okay, so if there are gaps and you know we don't have necessarily everything we need to get from the adversary getting into uh, achieving their goal, let's look at some ways of filling these in in a logical fashion that sticks to the spirit of the adversary as much as possible. I'm going to go over four techniques for filling in gaps. Uh, first is is adding techniques from the software that the adversary is using. I'm going to fill in some of those dependencies that I just identified um, and add those in. I'm going to take a look at peer adversaries. So you know maybe we're still not able to get enough intelligence on stuff that's directly related to the the one we've chosen. Let's look at their peers. Let's look at people who are operating like them, uh, and we can we can borrow from as well. And finally, if all of that fails, let's look at what lots of adversaries are doing. You know, might be something that they're doing as well. So if I go back to the attack group page, this is all the software that we've uh, associated with Turla. Uh, there's a mix of different types of things in here. For starters, we have uh, what I'm going to call utilities. So these are tools uh, that are in every case but PSExec built into Windows. Uh, PSExec obviously being part of Sys internals, so something that they they uh, probably downloaded over the course of the intrusion, but it's a general purpose tools that anyone's going to have access to it. Next, we've got uh, public tools. So our, our public offensive tools. Uh, Turo, like a lot of actors out there, is a user of Mimi Cats as well as Empire. Uh, and so this is something that, you know, it's not just specific to Turo. We see tons of different adversaries using. But Turla has a lot of possibly unique software. So these are pieces of software we have listed for no other adversary but Turla. We think that maybe they were written for them or written by them, but we at least don't have evidence of them um, being used elsewhere. And so for filling in software, I'm going to start with just this possibly unique to Turla set. And I've got a couple reasons I'm going to do that. So the, the first is that uh, some of the other tools that were in there, like um, uh, Mimi Cats, uh, Empire, or if they've been using something like Cobalt, those tools have a ton of functionality. Um, off the top of my head, I think Cobalt, we've got over 65 uh, techniques mapped to. Uh, and so it starts to just color in the entire matrix, not necessarily the pieces that uh, Turtle is actually using. Uh, something I've seen is that adversaries have a tendency to use more of the functionality of their own tools too than general purpose they're using. And that, that makes a lot of sense that, you know, if, if you are commissioning these or, or buying these tools, you're probably not going to ask for a lot of functionality that you never use. So if I take all of the techniques that are associated with each of these tools, add them together, I get something that looks like this. And again, um, I'll release the slides so that you can zoom in a bit better. Right now, uh, I'm just more showing sort of the shape of the coloring. You can see that it, this adds an activity across a lot of different tactics. So we've, we've got um, a much, much more material here. And if I go back and then add my Turla profile back into that, I've now got quite a bit more there. So blue was what we already had with Turla. Red is what we just added in with the software that they're using. And green's the overlap. So green is, is what we already had. And so I'd pointed out exfiltration was kind of thin in the original profile. Well, so adding in the software they're using has, has helped fill that in a bit. So we've now got something like is uh, just not, not just cloud storage, but also exfiltration over command and control channel. And so some more options for us to be able to work with too. So I've still got some of those missing dependencies though, even, even with the software added in. So the next thing I'm going to go through is fill in the missing dependencies. 
I didn't actually find a lot of those in Turla specifically, but there are definitely actors where there, there are more of these that you'll find. Uh, and so I'm going to take the fairly simple step with the missing dependencies I'd found to simply fill them in. So, you know, we're trying to stick in the spirit of the adversary. They probably did these things in order to uh, accomplish those other techniques or after those other techniques. So I'm going to bring those into our profile. So that now gives me a relatively well uh, fleshed out adversary profile. So this also isn't coloring in quite as much of the attack matrix as it might appear here. Um, I have only expanded out sub techniques where there are techniques selected in them. So again, I'm trying to keep the slides, um, I'm trying to keep the matrix actually fitting on a slide, but it, uh, there are quite a few sub techniques that are still tucked in here that are not selected by Turla. So this is still keeping us to uh, a scoping that is, is in the spirit of Turla. So I, I think we're good here. You know, I, I think for Turla itself, this is, is probably sufficient for us to work with in, in any scenario we want to create. But, you know, what if I was working with an actor where, where I couldn't do that? So the next thing I could do is start examining pure adversaries. Turla is attributed to be a Russian state actor that likes to steal information. So who else in attack do we have that looks like that? Uh, the, the ones that, that jump out are APT 28 and 29. These are the two groups that were attributed by the U.S. government to be behind the DNC hacks a couple of years ago. Uh, they've been very prolific, uh, and they, they do a wide range of their own activities. Uh, so, you know, this is just taking those two actors, combining them together. I could use them like this, where I'm just taking every technique from both, mashing them together and using it. Or, or maybe I just want to use it as a way of seeing what's popular for them. So the uh, green techniques are where there's overlap between these two adversaries. Lastly, you know, so if, if the peers aren't enough, Maybe I can just look at what techniques are common out there. So a number of companies over the past couple of years have started publishing annual reports on what attack techniques that they've seen over the past year. Uh, and so looking at a couple of companies' reports on what techniques they saw in 2019, we can start to use those to fill in gaps. So the first one I'm going to use is Red Canary. So they put out a report. It's actually got top 20 in it, but uh, you can actually read the text on this one. So it uh, is going through, and it's in order, but it, it's important to understand, uh, again, what this means. This is the top uh, 10 techniques that they saw in the places that they have uh, sensing in and compared with their actual detectors. So it's not necessarily the 10 most popular techniques. It's the 10 most popular techniques they saw. And, and one way you can see it is so pulling in recorded future. Uh, another company who put out top 20 techniques this year. I'm again cutting them down to 10 for the slide. But you'll note that the only overlap between these two lists is process injection. So we may want to combine a couple of these together in order to see where the overlaps are, uh, yeah, add their data. But these are giving us some ideas of things that we know at least have been out there in the wild a bunch in the past year. So it doesn't tell us that Turla did these. It doesn't tell us that, you know, 28 or 29 did these. But a bunch of people did them somewhere. Uh, and so adding them into our profile, you know, may be still sticking to a, a realistic APT profile. And again, wouldn't do this unless um, I wasn't able to get it directly from the threat intelligence on the actor. So we've filled in some gaps. We've got, you know, a lot of things colored in now. You know, we've got our, our pretty picture. Uh, so what do we do with it? You know, so how do we actually turn this into more of a profile? So I, I talked about a couple gap techniques that I didn't use. And so going back to my Turla profile, that is Turla plus the software that appears to be unique to them plus filling in those dependencies. So I'm going to want to do something like this. Um, so I've got my techniques, I've got my tactics, and I'm going to want to start to carve down to the techniques I want to actually use. 
And those techniques have a flow to them. So I've talked a teeny bit about dependencies, like where one technique is going to require another. There are often spaces where one tactic is generally going to require to another one too. Attack is not ordered. I um, mean, obviously, yes, things off to the left in attack often happen before things to the right in attack, but there is no strict ordering to it. It is not a kill chain. And so uh, tactics may happen in different orders. They may not appear at all in an intrusion, but we are going to want to force some ordering on them for operation so that we can actually build up a plan. So here what I've done is I've started with uh, initial access. So I've got the adversary breaking into the environment, followed by execution. So the, the code actually getting run. So that's, that's also got the malicious file in here that I, I filled in using dependencies. From execution, they're going to be doing both a discovery and privilege escalation. So I'm going to be able to do a lot of my discovery without needing extra privileges. At the same time, I'm going to be building up so that I can do my defense evasion, credential access, and persistence. Some of um, Turla's defense evasion does require uh, privilege escalation. So they do things like hidden file systems, which is a, a fairly unusual technique. Um, and then, you know, so from my credential axis, I'll then be able to do lateral movement. You know, I've got my OS credential dumping, which lets me do my Samba Windows administrative shares. And the arrow is so supposed to loop around from one side to the other, back to execution, and start it all over again. So in order to bring this even closer to, to something I can operate with, the f final uh, organizational step I'm going to do is to organize technique flow into plan phases. So everything I've talked about here is started at initial access. And so that's using what's in enterprise attack today. But obviously, there are some steps that an adversary, as well as a adversary emulator, is going to need to do before they get into the environment. So that's this phase one. Uh, and so you might not be familiar with the tactics, reconnaissance, and resource development, and that's because they won't be in attack for another few months. But stay tuned. Uh, we actually are extending uh, attack to match the scope of the uh, cyber kill chain and activities that come before you break into an environment. Phase two, um, I've got the adversary operating, setting down their footprint, expanding out, and getting into all the systems that they want to be in. And then in, instead of um, collecting in parallel, I've got this particular adversary doing their collection and exfiltration at the end. So they've got the footprint, and then they steal the information. Uh, and so I'm, I'm putting these in order so that we can use them for operations. This isn't going to be perfect, but a lot of these techniques and tactics have the required ordering to them. So the pieces I'm, I'm not really going to cover today, but just a, a few thoughts on making sure that we're applying Intel as we go through the entire process. So we're going to want to develop tools to be able to do this. Uh, you know, want to be able to think, can we do this with COTS free open source? Are those reasonable for the given actor? You know, so in some cases, we may have an actor who's using Empire or Cobalt. So, you know, it's, it's, the answer to that is fairly obvious. If we have an actor that's doing nothing but bespoke tool development and using techniques that aren't really supported by much that's out there in public, you know, we may need to do some custom work. But wherever, regardless, you know, trying to keep those payloads uh, inspired by the APT. So you know, looking at how they're, they're packing and everything else, trying to stick to that intelligence. And finally, as you actually operate. Obviously, you're going to have to set up all the infrastructure, test it out, and get it going. But once you're ad emulating the adversary, you know, try to think about the modus operandi that we thought about earlier. Adversary is trying to steal targeted information. You know, the goal is, is not to um, get into get into the domain controller. Or I, I saw somebody in, on Discord like that. I said, hack the Gibson. Um, you know, think about your goal throughout this and where is it you're actually trying to get to. And then think about pacing. So, you know, how is it that the adversary actually operates? Are they somebody that is slow in, in methodical and how they're spreading out? Are they doing a smash and grab? Um, you know, and so, so think about that as much as possible. So in closing, you know, some of the things I hope 
take away from this is pick your adversary wisely. So there are a lot of things you can actually think about to leverage Intel in the selection of an adversary in the first place. The Intel on your adversary isn't going to be perfect. Doesn't matter if you're getting it from attack, from original sources or wherever, but you know, it, it is not going to be perfect, but you can still emulate an adversary with imperfect Intel. So this is, you know, something you can pull off, even though you know, you're not going to know absolutely everything about an adversary. So I'll post my slides, but uh, some of the links to resources I used in here between uh, Attack Navigator and Attack itself. Uh, we've put out a couple of emulation plans where we've used a lot of this process and, and how we've actually done it. Um, and we've got our own uh, red team uh, automated tool, Caldera, that we've actually uh, ported at least the APT29 emulation plan over to. And I'm I'm uh, reachable in a couple different venues uh, via attack, via Twitter, whatever. And so that's it for me. Uh, and so I'm I'm going to be answering questions in Discord uh, after this, but a, a couple I did catch scroll by that I'll, I'll take on now. So I, I saw somebody saying, um, "Am I talking about the pre-attack stuff?" Uh, yes. So we're undergoing a merger right now of the information that's in pre-attack. We are refactoring it down to uh, just uh, information that is is technical things that some defender somewhere can see. So um, some of the intelligence planning steps are going to be going away, and we're refactoring that into two new tactics, uh, reconnaissance and resource development. So that's something can expect to see in the next release of attack. And with that, um, I will be answering questions in Discord, and uh, thank you for attending my talk. Thank you so much, Adam. And thank you for supporting not only the, the community and the DEF CON, but the Red Team Village as well. Amazing talk. And for those of you that are watching in Twitch, YouTube, Periscope, uh, there should be a link in the bottom of the screen. That's where you actually can get access to the Discord server that Adam was mentioning. And uh, we're going to go on a brief break, and the next uh, presentation will start in just